Hey everybody, it's I, uh, Sipling Vaughn, and I'm at my local dive bar. There's the other side of the booth. Uh, you're going to hear people in the background. That's what happens when you're working a public environment. You're going to hear things being said by other people, which is good because you don't want to completely isolate yourself by always being alone by yourself. So hearing other people's opinions and stuff, whether you disagree or agree with it, uh, makes you more rounded individual. So, and I like working here. Uh, I swear my, it's, it's, this is where I can get stuff done. This is where I can really focus. So, um, I've been working on this piece more off screen. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I didn't do the video yesterday. I was uh, really working on the top part here. You can see where I got Tig put in here with uh, his lightsaber. <clears throat> Remember how I said I wanted to do, like, have him do like, I actually took, Miss Stippling took a picture of me in this, to, in this pose, um, had a, uh, a core to a paper, for a paper, uh, paper towels, held that as a lightsaber. And then I went up here and I put in Valance and put him in. When I did him initially, let me show you. Uh, I initially did him as a straight on shot. And I didn't care for it because by doing it as a straight on shot, uh, it it stifled the movement of the, looking around the page. Whereas the face I ended up going with, and I like I, I worked it all out on tracing paper, and then I light boxed it on orn. So, but yeah, but working on it, I worked it up again with a different angle, and then you can see what the result is because I think it does a much better job of flow because remember you're going to have Amazona over here so you'll have whether your whether your eye flows you this way or this way having the face like this works much better and notice how I did it so that way you have tension you don't have parallel lines you almost have two diagonal lines that will converge up around his, his eyebrow so again you create visually inside this it just in this isolated area of the image you have uh, they correct they so you're visually your hand would your eye would go up the barrel of the gun and it's going to come to a, a confliction with here at his eyebrow and then brings it this way so just an idea of how when you're working on it, even if it's not, even if you're not intentionally going to have that effect design-wise, inherently you have that inside of you uh, over time to do that. So I just, like I said, I looked at it and I was like, this isn't working with the way I had it. Let's redo it. So I did it, it looks much better, so. Um, this week, Billy Tucci launched on Kickstarter uh, the 30th anniversary of She, the very first issue, and hey, he has surpassed Indiegogo with having it on Kickstarter. This shows how Billy is Doritos. He doesn't look at going to one crowdfunding platform. He goes and he has it on multiple uh, crowdfunding platforms. Uh, that we can get the most amount of backers. So uh, I, I applaud him. That's the reason why Billy Tucci is Doritos and everyone else is your local brand of potato chip. Uh, if you want a more, if I did a much more uh, in depth analogy or explanation to what is Doritos on my review of the unboxing of uh, She. Uh, Oh, the hardbound uh, omnibus, uh, Senioraka. Sen I know I'm pronouncing it. The one he's just funding, he's fulfilling now. Okay. I did it about a week ago, or two weeks ago, actually. So if you go over to my channel and look at it, it's entitled Billy is Toritos. So check that out. It gives a much more further explanation. So, but yeah, Billy and Debbie, uh, even when I was, uh, gave a shout out to them, uh, said hi to them on the stream that or uh, Thursday the 7th uh, they 
uh, th gave a shout out and thanked me for my video uh, with my analogy of what is why I refer to Billy as Doritos and why so many crowdfunders need to be Doritos. Andy Smith, Andy Smith is Doritos. Uh, Graham Nolan, when he did Two Fists of Manly Tales, he was Doritos. I think more and more creators need to look at what Billy's doing and uh, go on multiple platforms to raise funds for their campaigns so they can be Doritos too. So, but no, it was really good. And then uh, lastly, like Aaron Lepresti, he's been just talking about how because he's being shadow banned on Indiegogo, how he's going to look at uh, crowdfunding or an, uh, another site also. So uh, Aaron Lepresti with his upcoming, with his current campaign through Indiegogo uh, called uh, Kit Carter Planet Doom, he's probably going to become Doritos too. Uh, I was, and, and, and here's the thing. I think that he would do very well if he had, even if it was a stripped down version of the campaign or in Kickstarter or Fund My Comic, uh, I would say uh, he should do that. I think he'd do very well. Specifically, like, we take a look at it, and I've used this analogy before too, how Kickstarter is the Walmart of crowdfunding sites. Everybody knows it. Uh, they have such a long history of crowdfunding. Everybody knows what the, what the site is about as opposed to Fund My Comic, which is brand new, launched this year, or uh, Indiegogo, which has been doing its shadow banning campaign. So I would say definitely uh, Aaron Lepresti is going to become Doritos himself, and I think that if he were to get one to Kickstarter with his property, with him always having a family-friendly uh, type of book and uh, family-friendly uh, artwork, so uh, a newcomer, will enjoy his art, or find his artwork appealing, along with uh, die-hard uh, DC Marvel fans would uh, recognize it as, uh, uh, I don't want to say stereotypical, but traditional comic book art. I think he would do very well on Kickstarter. And uh, maybe that's what I gotta do, is I gotta uh, make a comment on tonight's episode of Aaron Live that Aaron should go on to Kickstarter to become Doritos. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I think he'd do very well with Kit Carter if he were to go on to, uh, on to Kickstarter. It's like as the saying goes, hey, you go where the money is. Uh, you can't put your, your commerce and, and capitalism will always win over your ideology. So, I just think he should do it. So, um, today's topic is kind of like the ongoing theme from this week was that one comic book store owner did a video that went viral talking about how we don't care about these writers who are self-inserting them into uh, Marvel and DC properties. We just want good stories and you're not giving it to us. Uh, he got dogpiled on by a lot of uh, creators, which what got me the most is one of those was like, these are creators that are defending Marvel and DC, and it's one of those where it's like, when was the last time you were published by Marvel and DC? When was the last time they hired you? Your, lo your loyalty is to a company that doesn't care about you and doesn't, I mean, I can understand if these guys were being employed by Marvel and DC, but they're not. So, and that's where, like, because of him speaking out and these trolls coming out of the woodwork, they were bashed back into the red work, woodwork, not just by comics gay fans, but by almost all types of comic book fans. They're like, no, this guy's absolutely correct. Don't, don't blame him for your mistakes. Um, he actually got to the point with this, uh, with the backlash and with the uh, attention, uh, Mark Millar had him on his channel for Miller time and talked to him. Um, I think that uh, the comic book store owner was uh, very gracious in how he presented the information to how Marvel and DC are not doing good. Let's be honest, Marvel and DC absolutely suck right now. And it shows in their sales. So, it's one of those where it's like Marvel and DC, 
And we've been, again, I mean, it's almost like one of those deals where it's like, we've been saying it for years, the whole reason why Comics Gate started was fans saying, hey, your stuff is shit, we don't want this stuff. Now you have a comic book store owner who's saying to Marvel and DC, your stuff is shit. And now, and the people that were, that were dogpiling are getting pushed back in, are getting pushed, and they're deleting their, their attack, of their, their uh, abusive tweets and postings and such. Um, it's where, like, and then of course, uh, Ethan, of course, thanked Mark Millar for uh, standing up for this store owner. Mark Millar said, cheers, bud. And it's become a hashtag uh, of the movement of the fans agreeing with this retailer that, no, they tried to cancel Mark Millar because he agreed with Ethan. Mark Millar is a professional. He looks at Ethan and goes, you know, I don't, may not agree with you, but you are very valid points. And he's just saying, hey, cheers, bud. Thanks for your, thanks for, and it, it was not even agreeing with him. He was simply acknowledging his support, which I find, again, it's, one of those, it's like, I mean, like, Mark Millar is uncancelable, okay? He has written his own ticket, uh, unless he, even if he loses, and he got keep in mind, he sold the rights to... When I say the rights, the publishing, not the publishing rights, the uh, getting it made into into TV and movies. Okay, as far as I know, he still owns the properties themselves. He can still publish properties. He can still publish those titles. He can still create new titles. He's not his hands aren't tied. That he's like forced retirement. And I think Mark Millar. Uh, he brought up great points. He goes, he goes, this is, he said to him, he goes, I think this is the I am Spartacus moment because everybody's rising up in the green and the, 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 the shill media that supports Marvel and DC and won't acknowledge that there's a problem, they're being booed into, uh, the boo, booed in submission. Uh, the Heidi McDonald's and Rich Johnson's, they're basically being, having to shut their mouths and they can't really have an argument anymore. Because you have someone as strong as Mark Millar, and let's think of look at, look at it this way. Okay, Mark Millar has more influence over your buying habits than Heidi McDonald and Rich Johnson will ever have. Because Mark Millar has produced something. He has the record of producing valuable content. So I have, and it's where we have the Spartacus moment. It's where. We can't. We have the cancel pigs being brought being brought up, and I love it that we have regular people saying, "No, you're calling them cancel pigs because all they do is like you. You're not trying to solve the problem. All you want to do is exasperate the problem. Okay, you just want to maintain the status quo of uh, shit going downhill. So I applaud all those newbies or all those normal comic book fans." that are coming out of the woodwork and defending uh, what's happening. And they're seeing like, hey, no, no, you don't attack this guy. More importantly, you're attacking him, how he physically looks. You're not attacking the message. Therefore, your argument has no merit. I love it. I absolutely love it. So, um, and the thing is, I thought about this going forward is right now, and we all hear everybody talk about how Marvel and DC are the temples of the industry, okay? Comic books, and the reason why comic book stores uh, are buying Marvel and DC is because that's what brings people into your stores, and if you're losing that audience, it's harder to uh, maintain, uh, an, maintain uh, income. And I thought about how Marvel and DC really had to push themselves story-wise and art-wise in the 90s because they weren't the only tent poles. Okay? A comic book store could survive carrying less Marvel and DC and carrying more of the other companies. And when I say the other companies, I'm talking about like how like image. Uh, the founders of Image being the superstars that they were with Marvel and DC. I mean, let's, play, let's be honest. 
Uh, they were still getting royal when they formed Marvel and when they formed Image, they were still getting all their royalty checks from Marvel and DC. Okay, Marvel and DC, specifically Marvel, bankrolled Image. Okay, those guys were able to create and publish without any cap with the capital they had was their royalty checks from Marvel and DC because they were such so strong with their products. That they had created for Marvel and DC, but you had other companies coming out. You had uh, Valiant Comics come out. You had uh, Ultra, Ult the Ultra Universe come out, and you had competition that was going at Marvel and DC's bottom line. You take a look. I mean, like like Marvel, they bought the Ultraverse and shelved it because they were a threat to them. Because they were like, oh, these guys, they're taking, they're getting too good, uh, their stories and art are getting too good, their characters are so much better than what we're putting out right now, they're, they're a threat by the competition, shelved those products. Now, from what I understood also, is one of the reasons why they also did that is because uh, the creators of the books, I guess they had some uh, creative rights to them. So if Marvel had published those properties, they'd have to pay those artists for their rights. Now, I might be completely wrong, but I think I remember hearing about that. So I might be wrong, I might not, but the point is, is that Marvel knew that Ultraverse was a threat so what they do? They bought them out. They bought them. They said that they bought them for the computer coloring. Um, that's what I thought it was for years. I thought that's the reason why they did. Apparently, nope, they bought them because they're too strong of a threat to them. Um, also, it also, if I understood, uh, the reason why is because uh, DC uh, was uh, going to buy Ultraverse and they saw how much of a threat the Ultraverse characters would be. Specifically, if they were then combined with DC to Marvel. So, but remember how Valiant, they first started Valiant, and then after they had like maybe a year's worth of, of titles, they then had a, their Unity, uh, it was gonna, I would call it their uh, uh, a welcome, the welcome to the U Valiant universe. Here's our crisis event. Uh, to introduce you to all of our characters. And Ultraverse did the same thing with Breakthrough. They had a unifying uh, crisis event to get you to buy the crisis event and it got you introduced you to all their characters and then afterwards uh, you were more interested in, in checking out all their titles. Uh, and the thing is, they, they weren't a lot, that, that was nothing new. Uh, I was introduced to Marvel really through the Secret Wars event. Uh, I was really got really even more gung ho about DC when they had Crisis and Infinite Earths. And I think that, like, Mark Millar, I think he has the ability to create his own, and those, and because of this, these companies became tent poles in the industry for stores, that they didn't necessarily need Marvel and DC. And so you can take a look at how, like, what that forced Marvel and DC to make changes so they could compete against these uh, competitive companies, so that way they remained the uh, top dogs. And you take a look at, like, right now, Marvel and DC are so weak that it is possible for a competitor to come in and become a temple. But it's up to the competition, the competitor, to make that happen. And when I say that, I think about how I will use Mark Millar as an example. Before I do, though, one example I would give is even uh, Jeff Johns with his uh, uh, was it ghost ghost machine or Mad Ghost. Uh, he started off with uh, 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 Geiger. And through that, uh, he had a special where he, he 
introduce the red coat. Uh, in Geiger, he introduced the uh, Junkyard Joe, which then became its own series. But the thing is, and I look at that, at, at the, just the names of the characters of the upcoming books he's going to have, I get the idea, the impression, that this whole thing was a, a DC proposal that he had that was shot down. So he's taken that proposal, he's reworking the characters so they're unique, but you really take a look at like Junkyard Joe, I mean that's the GI robot from uh, back in the day when, in Weird War Tales. Uh, the red coat. Remember how DC used to have a he was like a a Davy Crockett uh, knockoff, and how he had his own set of villains, and his villains were like red was a red coat. Remember, he had the, there was the one red coat, and he had a gold hand. Um, then you had the the he's proposed a new character coming out called the Huntsman. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the Huntsman, if he would get a character, he's going to be like a... I wouldn't be surprised if he's like a knockoff of like the Viking Commando or something like that, okay? I get the impression that this whole line of books that, that, that uh, Jeff is doing is a proposal for DC that was shot down and with DC going to shit and he's like, you know what, I've got this proposal I'll just retool it as my own I've got uh, Gary Frank in we're doing it and now he's pulling in even more talented artists to do the rest of the stories he's got he just announced this week I think it was or was last week Ivan Riaz is joining Ghost Machine so I'm I've got a, a, a he has the possible through image uh, Jeff Johns has the potential to create a tentpole. The only thing is, though, is that how he's doing it, it's when it's like, I get the sense that the characters are linear throughout time. So how much interaction are you going to have between the characters? You got to keep in mind, what makes a lot of these, what made uh, the books in the 90s so popular was there was a there was a shared universe so it was possible with uh, the the Valiant universe that after they in, uh, introduced uh, Turok in, Man, in the Man of War comic it was still possible like five or six issues later we could have uh, Turok guest star or in a, tour, in, in, in a two issue story of EXO we could have uh, the Shadow Man guest star in The Second Life of Dr. Mirage. You, you, you get what I'm saying. There's, You could have team ups. That way you could have like a Spider-Man, Iron Man crossover. That's what having a shared universe gave you. So that if you had one title that was doing well, you, had, you could have this character of a title that's struggling, have them guest star and boost interest in it to maybe boost sales for upcoming issues of the other title that wasn't doing as well. So I really do believe that we have the potential, if the people choose to, to create their own temple shared universe that can compete against Marvel and DC. Now with Marvel and DC right now, they don't seem to care. Well, remember, this is about the retailer because the retailer they need to survive. So if, let's say, Mark Millar, and, okay, and I think about this this week, Mark Millar has the ability, if he wants, to create his own shared universe. Um, he's got all these properties he's created, like he's got, you know, Wanted, Kick-Ass, Jupiter's Legacy, but they're all, like, in their own worlds. They don't cross over with each other. Well, and most of them, he's made clear, okay, this was my Jupiter's Legacy story. That story is over. This is my ambassador story. As far as we know, it's over. Um, what if he were to take, like, remember Crisis on Infinite Earths and how you had the multiverse and we took, like, this Superman from Earth 2. We took Geoforce from Earth 1. We took 
star brand from this earth and this character from the you know and they took different characters from different earths different periods of time of those earths brought them together for the crisis event okay what if mark millar has creates a shared universe for his characters okay he creates a threat and let's say it's at ground zero is so let's say this one earth and the multiverse and all of his you know kick ass is its own earth it's earth one jupiter's legacy is earth two that type of thing okay and what if he creates okay so you have ground zero earth this is where a major threat's threat if this threat succeeds it'll wipe out all the other earths okay so mark millar creates a harbinger character and he does a he does a crisis type of story and you take like kick ass from this earth um you take this character from jupiter's legacy this character from the nemesis line you know you get what i'm saying okay he takes multiple characters uh some that the care that the fans really like others that or maybe there's a side character from Jupiter's Legacy. Maybe there's like two or three side characters that weren't really utilized, but they were there in the story. It takes those characters, brings them to Ground Zero Earth. They fight the threat. And in the event to stop the threat, the Harbinger character dies. So when the threat is over, these characters are now stranded on ground zero earth and they now need to become they need to then start new lives on this earth and it's be doing that you can then have okay i'm going to have i'm launching now the crisis is over i'm going to have four titles come out of these four characters each character is going to have a four issue story arc I'm writing it. First, first story arc of Kick-Ass, I have Lee Weeks doing those four issues. Then after those four issues, I've got uh, uh, Oliver Cop uh, Copio uh, doing uh, a four-issue story. Now I'm going to have another four-issue story with um, Phil Jimenez. Then another four-issue story with uh, with Lee Weeks again. He could do an ongoing story without having to worry about deadlines because he's like, okay, this is a four-story four arc. Okay, Mark, you, okay, Lee, you got those four issues. I've got this started already for issues uh, 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 five through eight with this artist. That way he can do a monthly book and then with another title. So I mean, he's essentially creating his own universe. He's the writer. Um, after he does the initial launch, he's now the godfather. He's got characters being written by other uh, writers, but he's providing them with a treatment. Uh, he's providing with a plot. Okay, I can see. I can, and he, by doing that, he creates his own tent pole. He could even use this as a medium to sell all of his existing trades because if it takes one character from each story, he can re republish the trade paperback. What if he were to have each trade paperback at the end of the book, there's a two-page story of Harbinger re recruiting this character. So that way you have new fans picking up the trades and already they're being they're, they're they're discovering okay this is part of this new ongoing millerverse at ground zero or the existing fans are like i don't need to buy that i don't care about that have a who's who encyclopedia okay think about it this way if he does like a who's who and type of encyclopedia to introduce you to all these characters at the same time this book comes out, he's doing his uh, crisis at ground, er, er, at ground Zero Earth. That way, you can, when you're doing your story, you don't have to provide 
backstory to all these characters and where they came from, you can pick up this Encyclopedia Who's Who book to get you caught up into speed with all these characters. Whether he does it in a Who's Who format, how DC did it, or he does it like uh, the guidebook to the Marvel Universe, the way Marvel did it, or like DC does a lot of uh, D, like DK, they have a they have a contract, I guess, with DK, and they're always having like the DC encyclopedia where you open up a page to Superman. It's a two-page spread of Superman, and they take spot illustrations from like different periods of Superman or in his run, and they have like a little spot. They have like you know little insert panels, like giving you uh, giving you examples of how Superman flies and uses a super breath and, and eye vision type stuff along with text giving you insight to who he is and where he came from that type of stuff I would think something like that would be a good a good marketing tool because you gotta keep in mind if he does that he already has he can use the spot he can use the uh, panels from the existing trades along with maybe a new splash image of the character to create it, so he could relatively he could, he can relatively create a, a DC and like uh, I'm sorry a Miller verse encyclopedia of Ground Zero without getting you caught up to speed relatively very cheap. You'd have very little overhead because all the work's pretty much been done. So I think he has the ability to do that if he chooses to. If Mark were to do this and create. And get it popular enough that he's creating his own tentpole. Whether DC and Marvel pay attention or even care is irrelevant. We as fans will have we'll have new stuff to want to follow, and we could possibly potentially bring older fans back that don't want to have anything to do with what's going on with Marvel and DC. And Marvel and DC, they, we've lost, Marvel and DC have lost their audience, but we have, we're bringing back what comics used to be and get them, these fans we lost, maybe get them back in the store. Because I guarantee you, a lot of these fans that we lost that aren't buying Marvel and DC, they're still, I, I would gamble that they're still paying attention to what's going on. So even if it's like a two years later and they're like, man, what's going on with this Miller's verse? Looks like they go into a local comic book store and they start picking up an issue. And at this point, uh, you have the crisis event, you have the trades, and you get them back in. Maybe fans of Spider-Man that aren't even buying Spider-Man anymore and aren't even going to comic book stores anymore. They're like, wow, okay, this, guy, this looks really good. This, this title here kind of reminds me of Spider-Man. I think I want to start picking this book up. Okay, where are the trades for this? Okay, here are the trades. I... Hey, I could completely off my rocker, but I do think that there is a possibility that if Mark Miller really wanted to, or Mark Millar, if he really wanted to, he could create his own tent pole in the comic books industry again with the stores without worrying about Marvel and DC. Because remember, the whole reason why, uh, if I remember correctly, Marvel pretty much created their own imprint slash publishing division within Marvel just to keep Mark Millar there. Because they knew how much of a threat, how, how, how much of a draw he was. And Mark Millar also brought up a great point, is remember, Everybody talks story now, but Mark Millar does acknowledge you have to have superior artwork, high quality artwork, to get the people to pick up the book. You could have the best, best, best damn story there is, but if you have picked up, if you have, the artwork looks like absolute shit, you're not going to get the fan to pick up your book. They'll look at, they'll flip through it at the comic book store and go, oh, God, no, this looks like shit, and put it back. So I look at it where it was, where, okay, 
the writing may tell the story, but nine times out of ten, your artwork is going to sell the book. Okay? Story tells, artwork sells. Okay? It's just like features sell, benefit. I'm sorry. Features tell, benefits sell. Okay, that's how they used to use it in the retail world. Okay, I'm looking at it this way, where you gotta have, you gotta have good, good artwork to get the people to buy into your story. Once you've bought, once you have a good artwork, and once you have good artwork, and you've sold them on that book, yeah, you can then kind of go with a cheaper artist. But you can't go to you can't go with a penthouse level artist and then go with a basement level artist. You gotta go with a lower tier but still productive, visually appealing artist. And I think that's like people like Mark Millard not sees that, whereas Marvel and DC don't. And they don't give a fuck. Okay, so that's my take on it. I I think Mark has the ability to do it. And we need a temple. We need a new temple. Uh, we need something. To, we need someone who wants to get you back into the local comic book store. Because um, we can't wait on the crowdfunding ca uh, creators to have a large enough backlog to then go to the comic book stores and sell at the comic book store uh, to make a profit. We just can't. We got. We can't wait on them. We need as we need a Mark Millar to uh, basically give the comic book industry the kick in the ass that it needs to save it. Otherwise, Mark Millar is going to be doing crowdfunding just like the rest of us with his next book. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, remember, life is stressful, but that's why you just take it all one dot at a time.